Police have identified the body. Officers first thought was a dead sheep in Havelock North last week. She was 18-year-old Ariki Rigby. Ariki Rigby was last seen on Friday the 2nd of September. The next day, police were called to the car wreckage in Havelock North. Missing people and unresolved cases are starting to become like a habit of New Zealand. You know, they do say that she had broken bones. I suppose they forgot to mention that she also had her hands and her feet cut off. Also heard that she was gang raped. Justice for my sister Ariki. Her love for God was great, you know. He had been there for her when nobody else was. Um, my name is Anihira Henitapu Rigby. I'm from Hawke's Bay, Wairo, Gisborne and Tauranga. Um, so my father's name is Peter Wadamu Rigby and he's the one that's from Wairo. Our family whakapapa back there to um, Pakofai Marae in Fraser where our homestead is. Um, and then my mother, her name is Maimaru Henitapu Nahoka. I'm named after my mum and we're from Tauranga and also King Country as well because that's where our grandparents um, took us back to and Hastings, that's our main stomping ground. So as a child, we grew up in Rarika. Um, I was with my grandparents most of the time in King Country though. But whenever we did come back to Hawke's Bay, we would be in Marika. Um, that's where most of our family grew up and where they still are to this day. My family were a big family, or they are a big family, but our grandparents, they were the king and queen of our family. And so being with them most of the time, you know, I was privileged with having all my whānau around me a lot of the time, all the cousins, you know, growing up in Annie Papa's house. Um, because things with my mum, they never would go well for very long. Um, and my father, my mother and my father weren't together for very long when I was younger. Um, I only remember parts of him in our lives. And then... He, I don't know what he would do most of his time, but when we were with mum, um, she would, you know, she would love on us. Um, she would spoil us most of the times, um, Ariki more than me. And so me and Ariki, my sister, her name's Ariki Marie Phoenix Rigby, we're the only full-blooded from my mother and my father. So we were always together um, and everyone tried to keep us together. So if we, if one went to Nana Papa's, then we both went and then mum would come and take us back. Um, but as the years got on, my mother would only come back and she would only take my sister. And our dad, he wasn't in our lives until... I think I was 16 and Ariki would have been, so there's a four and a half year difference between us. She would have been 11, 12. I remember that I was so happy to finally be a sister. I remember loving on her like if I felt like my heart was full having a sibling in my life. So I was the only child for four and a half years. So I really, really wanted a sibling. Um, and then we would be moving around a lot. So I do remember when Ariki was a baby, we were living with my auntie Ali and her family in Hastings. And it was, um, I remember when she was in her cot, and I had tried to, to like see her. I wanted to jump up there and see my baby sister. And I had actually accidentally tipped her, her cot over. 
and my parents come running in and then they picked her up and then they growled me a little bit but not that much because they knew they were like oh so I just wanted to see my sister I'm so sorry you know and um <laughs> so that was the like the youngest memory, she was only a baby then that I can remember. Growing up with her most of our life it was good with her. Um, we did have sibling fights though, you know, like how siblings do. And I remember one time I got mad at her. Uh, I told her I wish she wasn't born. But I didn't mean to say that. I never said that after that ever again. I was only young, we were at the back of our grandparents' house. Oh, she picked up a shovel, and I still got the scar from that. She smashed it across my leg. And uh, and then my, I was about to give her a hiding, and my mum comes down, she's like, don't you touch her. And I was like, oh. But she just smashed me with a shovel. Because <laughs> for Ariki, I I helped raise her, other than my grandparents, so... When we would be with our mother, um, there wouldn't be like food in the cupboards and like the house will be a mess or, you know, things like that. So that's why our grandparents would always end up with us and I would always have to walk down the road and go see Nan and Papa, go to shopping in the cupboards and then walk home. To go feed my sister, or like I got really good at gardening, so that we would have vegetables and things like that. Like I had to take on those roles um, at a very young age, just so that my sister and I were okay. So a lot of the time, I would. That's why we would be in on the streets a lot why we would rather go play because we didn't really want to be home with our mum because I don't remember like most of the bad parts of when we were younger all I remember is that I was always cleaning and I was always we were always hungry and she would send us down to the shop and at that time you were able to like um, put things on tab and so we would ask for like milk and bread and things like that and they'd write it down and then she would pay it when her payday would come. So at least that was cool and, you know, we got help from our grandparents but then they would get sick of it and then we would end up back with them because um, my mother, she's diagnosed with, um, I think it's bipolar schizophrenia. And I didn't realise um, that she was actually sick our whole lives because I do remember her, like, she was a cool mum when we were young. But there was just moments um, where she doesn't even remember these moments where she'll be hitting me. She hit me a lot and I would take those beatings for Ariki. Like, she didn't get most of it. I did because... I was the eldest. I would lie a lot about what we were going through, but our family knew because they would see the bruises and they would see us, like, really skinny. So they, I think one time we went back there and my family told us that they could see our ribs because I don't actually remember that because, you know, I never looked at my parents when I was younger. But I was quite... We were quite little, um, and then we would fat him back up at my nan and my papa's. My first year of high school, year nine, that's when I finally moved back to Hastings. Mum was living in Flaxme at the time of Ariki. Mum didn't have much stuff in her house. Um, I think we only just had a bed in our rooms, like not much clothes, and... It was just repeating what I was going through growing up all over again, but we're older. So, boom, still no food in the cupboards. Like, but it'll get to payday and she'll give us, you know, the money to go down and do the shopping. And we would come home, but the food wouldn't last very long. 
So coming to the end of the week, we were hungry. I started my first day at Flexmere College and my cousins weren't there. Gosh, they told me they were going to be there and fuck, I was shitting myself, <laughs> you know, because I had already been told, like, oh, you'll get stitches if you talk to or if you stare at a girl too long and they, they'll turn around and ask you what's your problem and, like, what are you looking at? Should I give you something to look at? <laughs> Things like that. Um, but people there, they knew who my family were. So they looked out for me while they weren't there. So Flex Me, I guess, is really gang affiliated. Um, mostly with uh, mob. So red is everywhere. Um, you wouldn't really get away with being um, a blue supporter in Flex Me, that's for sure. Or even wearing blue. Like, you don't even need to be a supporter. You wear blue in your overs. And it was the same with our hood as well in Rarika because, um, you know, after living with mum and she lost us again, we ended up with her sister living in Rarika, so we went from Flexmere to Rarika. My mother couldn't find the stability for us, the only stability we had was our grandparents. Um, and so... Those streets, very, yeah, very violent. Um, and everyone, it's like, if you were any other way, then you would pay for that. You would pay for being weak. You know, they pick on the weak. Um, or, you know, prey on the weak kind of a thing. And because when I started... I was probably considered as weak, eh? only because I was a good girl, and I didn't really, like, think about it like that, you know, because I wasn't raised in streets like that. In King Country, it's not like that. Um, everyone's whānau there, so actually fully going back there and living there and going to high school there with all of the teenage kids, you know, that are from the gang families and all that kind of stuff and they've been through some stuff and been exposed to some things. That's just how they were. Like, I did really well and so did my sister. Um, she was always the top of her classes as well. But she was actually better than me. She was the one who would come home with the trophies. You know, I'll come home with certificates, but she'll come home with trophies, you know, play of the day and all those kind of things. Um, what, was, what did she play? In yeah, things? so she was good at netball, basketball. Um, she loved the rugby. But with our grandparents, they didn't really like us playing rugby because we were really good at netball. But I wanted to experience other things then, and I wanted to do what everybody else around me was doing um, and because it was so normal to drink, smoke drugs, roam, um, fight people. When I was about 16, yeah, 16 and 11, but then Ariki was 11, that's when our dad came back into our lives. So that was because of our auntie, living with our auntie, um, my dad and his partner, at the time, they were about to get married. And they also had another daughter. Her name's Rain now. And so they wanted us to be at the wedding. And that's how we first started coming back into our dad's lives was being reaching out for that. And I'm blessed that our auntie gave us that opportunity because we always wanted it. Um, it's just that my mother had a protection order on my dad, like, when we were babies, and we were listed down on that, so if my dad was to come around us, he would go to jail. And then, so, I'm starting a new high school, I think I started Freiburg in Palmerston North. I was literally only there for a month.
maybe three weeks at the high school. I was with my mum for like six weeks, maybe two months. Not that long. Because she had started abusing me again. It started off like emotional. She was really emotionally like... Because I would do myself up when I was going to high school. I'd straighten my hair, do my makeup, make sure my uniform was nice, and I'd go to school. And then she would start, she started calling me names, started calling me a hood rat slut, saying I was ugly, all these kind of things. And I, that's when I um, started actually thinking suicidal was then. And my sister, after the Palmy incident, because, you know, I, was, I had to ring my stepmom, and then it got really bad to the point where my mum was throwing my things out the, out the door all over the lawn. And then the police got called, she called the police on me. And so I ended up at the police station. And so they pawned off their laptop to come and get me from the police station and took me back to um, Hastings and it was my dad and my stepmom, some of my siblings and again she saved me <laughs> but not that long after that she lost my brother and my sister. Um, she had tried to run in front of a car holding my brother and she was ripping up the carpets in the house so that's when Sif's um, started actually getting involved in our family was then and um, I think yeah they went to my grandmother so she had moved to Tauranga at, the, at that time so they were there and then I was in Kisbin so I had went from my aunties to my dad's and then Back to my auntie, graduated, flexed me, and then I moved. So I made sure I finished school first. But I was the youngest all my year, or one of, so I was only 17 when I graduated. And then when I moved there, um, I really wanted to be with my sister. And then my mum, she had gotten out of the mental unit, and she had gone to Tauranga. Um, she had gotten herself right. Ended up with my auntie's house, um, which is her older sister. And uh, they were living right next door to my name. So she came down with my brother to come and get out of here. And then they stayed for the night. And that was nice. But I was sad to see my sister go. I didn't want her to leave. Because shortly after that, we were going to get our own home. So that's why we still had her. Like, I planned to actually keep her. <laughs> I didn't want to give her back because, you know. Um, and then we ended up in our own house, like, I think a month after that. Or, oh, yeah. And then I just turned 18. And... Um, I had to, I got a call, I had to go to Tauranga again, this time my mum's lost it again, she's back in the unit, so I had to go there, and my aunties, they made us, they got a skip in, they made us clear out my mum's whole entire house all by ourselves. And my sister, she was broken. And I was like, damn, shouldn't have let her take you. And I was like, it's all right, I got you, sis. Helped her clear the house out, back off Nan again. And then eventually I had to go back to my own life. Oh, I also didn't get to see my brother either. So I just drank and I drank. And I became so addicted. 
My house was a party house for a whole year. I was heartbroken. So I went into the bathroom and I was like, no, I'm done. Just over this life, far out. And then, yeah, they, they took me anyways because they were like, no, you're not all right. Because she was telling them, no, she's just trying to, oh, you've got to take her to the hospital. So, yeah, I ended up getting admitted. Um, and she was there for me the whole entire way. She saved my life. And then while I was there, um, we get a call. Arakis in hospital. Hey, what do you mean Arakis in hospital? Arakis tried to kill herself. I start losing the plot, start pulling my eyes out. I feel like my heart is just broke. Started beating up the fence. <laughs> broke my hand. I was going to beat up my family. <laughs> um, and then, because we didn't know she was alive or not. But then uh, my sister started, you know, getting into the streets. She just wanted to start experiencing life. Um, because when my, when what happened to my mum and, and that in Tauranga, when we had to move the everything out of the home, I had found out that what was happening to me in my younger years, that's what was happening to my sister. And I didn't think, you know, I didn't think that my sister would end up going through that, getting hurt herself, being the mother to our brother, trying to go to school, she'll go to school late because she'd have to clean up the house and do my brother. So that is why she lost them. And she never got them back. I think she might have maybe once, and then she lost them again. And that was the last of it. Um, but then Araki go, yeah, Araki was hard out in sifts at this point. Te Tama stayed with our uncle, he's been with him the whole time. And he's still with him now. Because our mum, you know, eventually she heard she was with our dad. And she put up a thing, you know, put up a fight. So Araki ended up going back to Sifs again. But Sifs had given her to my stepmom. And I wish that she was able to just stay there. But she was getting into too much trouble. I had to get her off the streets. Started turning into a bit of a street kid. Like, really violent. Um, drinking. She started doing the things I was doing. Started fighting a lot of people. And she was from, going from Kira to Kira after that. And then they had um, moved her to Wanganui Girls College. Um... And then I had moved back to Gisborne. Um, and then I, but this was different, you know, I was um, with a friend and I was flatting. I was on the training farm. Araki was at Wanganui Girls College. And then, yeah, I was just living my best life, single for a year and all that kind of stuff. Then I met the father of my son. And I fell pregnant at 19. So this is going into the Christmas holidays. My son was born in September. Um, and then two weeks after that, I started applying for them through um, the system. Had to do like a police vetting, get doc like medical certs and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, and then I did all of that. And then, yeah, I got granted her and my brother because... They also have to come into your home and see if you've got the right space for them, which I did. And, yeah, I felt so proud of that. I was like, yeah, yeah, cracked it for us. We can have yous. Gosh, I've been wanting yous for ages. And I felt, uh, I was, that was the best feeling of my life, finally getting my sister back. And then she came back and, oh, far out. I missed her so much. Like, 
you know, her being away from us and being in the system, we barely got to see her. Barely got access to her. So far out. That was like, yeah, the best moment of my life at that point, other than just having my son. She's fully in her teenage years. So she's fully, like, not listening and rebelling. And so... She would barely be home. She would want to hang out with all her street mates again. And I would, like, put a curfew on her and everything. I was strict on my sister. She always had food in the cupboard, you know, always. Everything was always sorted, so she knew. Um, and then I think it got to Christmas Eve. Like, it was really bad. She was leaving my house with knives in her pockets, going to events with her friends. And I'd only find out when I get back and I'll grab her jacket and I'm like, hey, pull it out. What's this, sis? What are you up to? Don't be going around, walking around with weapons and things like that. What are you doing when you leave my house? I'm trusting you to go and hang out with your friends because you're older now. And then, you know, so me and her start arguing. It just started getting worse and worse. All of the fighting, all the drugs, you know, far out. I was getting worried, really, really worried for my sister. Um, Look, can I ask then from there, when was the last time you saw her? Was he? In my driveway. She was um, coming to show me her new car that she had saved up because she was wrecking. And then, um, came to spend a little time with me. She said she was going on a road trip to see our brother because she missed our brother. Um, Because after me giving them back and losing them and stuff, that was the last time she got to see him before she was back in SIFS again. So once we were up here, she wanted him so bad and she had her own apartment, so she wanted to go and steal him. She was telling me all about it. I was like, no, sis, you can't steal him. That's not the right way to go. you got to do it properly, sis. <laughs> like I did for you, you know. I can show you or I can do it for us, sis. And then I'll get our brother back and, like, so, yeah, she was going to go. But then she called him and they were away at an unveiling. So she was like, oh, he's not even home. I'm going to go to Hastings and said, no. No, don't you go back there? Gosh, you've been through enough stuff there, sis. Like, because after the stuff, when I had to send her away, she ended up in Sif's carers, but in Hawke's Bay. So she was, um, She went on the right path after that, actually, you know. She um, had strict rules. She didn't go back to high school. She um, started a course, and then she started working at 16. Um, And then she started Youth Nation. I started Legacy after losing her. I was so hurt, that's why. But she had started Legacy Diamonds here in Auckland, um, the last time my mum had her. So it was always in my mind. So it's a church group. Yeah, so that's a church group. Um, it's born, oh, it's birthed out of Destiny Church. And so our family's in there, and Araki was able to um, go in through that way as a youth because she was my mum. She needed some healing. And so, yeah, after I had gone through all that stuff with her, Oh gosh, I needed some healing too. <laughs> so yeah, I went to go suss it out. It was my cousin's birthday, so I was like, oh, I'll come see you since you're running this program. It's just your birthday. And then I really got into it. Started hearing all these girls around me starting to share the, what they had been through. Because at that point, I'm a sh- closed book. Ain't nobody getting anything out of me unless I tell you you have to be so close to me. Otherwise, nah, you don't know nothing. 
and um, that's when I started like opening up again. And then the photos started going up of me there, and then Araki saw them, and then she jumped back on too. And then I started, um, that's when I actually started going to church. And then she started coming. And then I was like, oh, there's my sister again. We're back in each other's lives. It wasn't that long after as well. So that was cool. So boom, I was seeing her all the time after that. Any excuse to see my sister. Um, you know, but she's strict. She's like, oh, no. Um, I think she was with a cure called Arama. So Arama's picking me up, dropping me off. Oh, no, i got to go now. I'm finished this, so I can't hang around. i got to go home. So she was really, you know, on her stuff. And I was proud of her because she was still living in Hawke's Bay but finally changing her ways, you know. She knew better at that point. And then so she's a, a youth and then she starts serving in the church and then I'm like starting to get really proud of her because I wouldn't really do these things. She was the one who was doing these things. I just was trying them out because she showed me. And then when I could see her serving and I'm like, whoa, buzzing out at her. And then she starts getting up on stage and she starts doing prayers on stage. And I'm like, okay. And I'm in the in the crowd, like, <laughs> feeling shame as. Like, where is my little sister showing me up again? For real. And I was just so proud of her. And everything I knew she, she had been through. And she was trying to overcome it and she was trying to be confident again. She was trying to be herself again. And so, yeah, I was following suit, obviously. So I started studying my um, level four youth work development um, because of her. I wanted, you know, when I had her in my care, I didn't know how to help her mentally. I didn't have the tools. Nobody taught me them. So once we were back in each other's lives, I was like, nah, that's it. I'm going to learn now, sis, for you. I'm going to know how to help you because I've got people around me showing me how to help you. And then, yeah, so I got qualified in that. And then I was her youth leader. So that was cool, being my sister's youth leader and then seeing her grow and flourish and then start to be her confident self again. She was smiling a lot. She was getting back into sports and working and then buzzing me out because I'm not working and I'm like, oh. <laughs> so that's why I, and, um, I actually flipped my life around was because she was flipping her life around. And then so we were doing that for a while. We were doing really good together. Um, then we started growing, like, spiritually. We started, um, like, doing Bible studies, like, classes. They're called inside-out classes. Um, you know, we learn the presence of God. We learn about salvation and all those kind of things. And that's why, you know, I went there because I knew that we would be together at all these things because there will be Sunday, Monday, and then Tuesday, legacies, and then Wednesday, there'll be like marketing, and or like at the marketing, she would um, write raps, and she was really talented, she would sing and all those kind of things, and um, one of her youth videos was going around, you shared it, it was of her singing, yeah, that would have been at one of the Wednesday nights, and then um, Thursday would be break, and then Friday, Youth Nation. And so I had to go, you know, I'm a youth leader, trying to be, and because she, she'll be there as well. And then Saturday break and then Sunday see my sister again. So it was lovely. It was lovely um, living this new life with her, um, learning all these new things because we had grown up with a faith. We had grown up on a marae. Uh, Mana Araki is called the marae. That's actually where she's named after. That's in King Country, and that's why my grandparents lived there. So they were the Komatwas of this marae. And um, at that time, um, Alexander Phillips, people know him as the last Māori prophet um, of our days, um, 
and it was amazing, you know, knowing him, knowing that life. And so I guess the older you get, when you're raised in a faith, like you kind of do it out of habit, but then eventually you got to find your own truth. You know, you've got to start learning it yourself and start knowing why your grandparents or, you know, your family went this way. And so this is me and Ariki trying to find our truth, you know, trying to learn more of God and what he had to offer us. Because at the end of the day, for my sister, why she went so hard and what she did was because when she was alone and when she had nobody, God is who she had. And, you know, getting her diary back and reading through all of her personal thoughts, this was how I was able to understand why she did what she did. And then... You can see her love for God. Yeah, her love for God was great. You know, he had been there for her when nobody else was. And so that's why she was serving. That's why she was getting up and praying and why she could find this confidence. And, like, I was going along, but it was, you know, I wasn't at that stage that she was at yet. She was already, you know, reading the Bible and understanding it and, you know, talking to him in her alone time and all those kind of things. Whereas for me, I was just, I was going and I was loving the lifestyle. I was loving how uplifted I felt, um, you know, because I can, could feel that presence there. I could feel this love and I could see it in all the people around me. So I wanted that in my life not having that after losing my grandparents, that was the first time we had ever, I guess, started feeling welcome again. And then um, Araki did an abstinence stand, an absolute abstinence. So that's when you make a, a stand for God. It's a promise to God. To abstain from marriage, or abstain from sex before marriage, you know, no drugs, no alcohol, no sleeping around, um, all those kind of things, you know, because the Bible has laws. God is, you know, a man of correction and a man of love. So. Eventually she made that stand because I was going to make that stand with her. We were doing these absolute abstinence classes together. So that's why when I mean we were trying to grow spiritually, we were doing all the spiritual classes together and learning. Um, But I guess I didn't realise that a lot of stuff started happening in her life again. Um, There were some trauma things she did not mentioned to me at all. So, um, oh, Sissy, I'm so sorry, but I'm going to have to say this. So my sister, we fell out of the church and she started just falling off again, you know. The evil one really was hammering at my sister and he was doing the same to me too. It's just... I always held on. My love for my sister was stronger than that. I'm like, nah, got to go. Got to take my baby. See his auntie. Got to have a better life. And then when she stopped coming, I'd still be like, no, surely you can come with me, sis. I still try to take her. Like, it's all right. You can go to church. Keep holding on, sister. And then, no, she wasn't allowed back. She ended up in really bad domestic violence. And she was staying at, um, I think, a, what do they call it? Yeah, a house that they're selling drugs at anyways. And she's fully into, you know, they're selling meth at this house. And then I found out that my sister, (sighs) 
she was starting to get hidings from not just her partner at the time, but also his friends. So they were all bashing her up in the room. So she started becoming a really violent person again, but this time worse, really, really worse. At this point, Araki's in the mental unit because she's so violent and she's acting out really badly. I think her in-laws might have put her in there. And then um, while she was in there, I think she learned a lot of things because um, she told me after that, sis, don't ever let our mum go back in there. They stab you with needles, they drag you up and, like, all these wretched things. And I was just like, oh, okay, I don't want you to go back in there, sis. I don't want mum to go back in there either. But while we were waiting up here for them to come home, the weeks were passing by and they were – mum was only supposed to go there. She was supposed to get out and then, you know, come back. But sister got out. She started losing the plot again. And then, gosh, next thing you know, my mum's putting her back in and I'm like, what? You're putting my sister back in there? Why? Just because she's hurt. And then she sees you and all of the hurt she's been through and then it's a bit too much and then, oh, you just decide to put her back in there. But she just needs love. When they actually rung me to take Ariki again, I couldn't. I was in emergency and then going from there to another emergency and then, oh, gosh, I was in no state to have my sister. I wish I could have, but that's why mum ended up with her. She got her own apartment until I got here. She got it two weeks before we got here. And then um, she was a, like a shell of her former self again. And I had just, you know, went through all the stuff of seeing my sister bring herself back up again just to see her like this hurt. It hurt me. And so... I started loving on my baby sister, you know. She would call me every day. Like, she couldn't even leave her front door. That's how bad her anxiety got. Um, and she would just think that everybody was out to get her. And then... I guess I, I already knew tools of how to help her now. So she was watching the word at home. So she was listening to God again. She was praying. She was, um, she gave up the drugs, the alcohol and all those kinds of things. She was trying to get herself right. So my sister, she got back into working again. And then that's when she had saved up for her van and then she had come over home. So that, that was her last memory that I've had, I have of her is her walk, walking at my doors, jumping in her car. Her window wouldn't wind up, so I had to put a, um, a rubbish bag over her because it started raining. You know, that was her sign. She shouldn't go anywhere. <laughs> and I was begging her to stay. She didn't want to. I was trying to tell her not to go. She didn't want to listen. Well, why was she going? Huh? Why was she going? She wanted to go um, to Hastings. Yeah. But at first she was supposed to go see our brother, so once she said Hastings, I was like, nah. Nah, you got beaten up there, you can't. Like, sister, you just went through some stuff there and it put you into this person that I came back to and now you've just come right and, you know. So I was like, kind of afraid for her to go back there, like, didn't want her to. And then she went back, so I told her, okay, well, make sure you go to dad's, eh? So she left my house. She just wanted to go for a holiday. So they did see her for the first week and then she ended up with her, her friend, um, living with her friend actually, and then she had found her a partner. Again, this partner was mob affiliated. So I was worried and I started looking for her, started, I mailed her Insta, um, couldn't find her Facebook because sometimes we blocked each other on Facebook and I was like, you know, ringing her phone and wasn't getting a hold of her. And then, um, you know, come to the next day, I'm still looking for my sister. 
And then I start that day. I start getting really, really worried. Like, and then there was this, this moment I had, and I was just like, kind of felt like my heart was ripped out of my chest, and I was just started freaking out. And I'm sitting on my phone, and I'm like, hey, still worrying. Gets to the next night, and I'm still hard out looking for her, and then. I'm starting to ask everybody at this point because usually I can find my sister. But this time, when I'm trying to look for my sister, I can't find her. And then I'm on the phone and then my baby daddy comes down the hallway. He's like, hey, you need to come see this. I'm like, hey, come see what? (laughs) And then I jumped up, ran down to the TV and then on the news, there was a car and it was on fire. You know, it had been burnt. I felt my heart drop. And I was just like, hey, hey, no. No, 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 no. Start crying, start freaking out. I got to the next day, and then the sprint car comes up again. But this time, there's a female in it, and she's young. And I start breaking even more. I start losing the plot because then the queens apparently passed away. And I'm losing the plot at them like, oh, get this off there. How come you're saying that there's a burnt car with a female in it and you're not even naming it as a homicide? That is a homicide. Why aren't you saying, like, you know, I'm fully, like, only because I'm already telling my some of my family, I think this might be sister. And then at that point, I was like, damn, it's been days since I've got to gotta report you missing. So my cousins, I sent my cousins in because they were going around door knocking at all the places trying to find her. Um, even went over to this um, Wyatt house that apparently, because she got kicked out of her friend's house, and then she went over to this Wyatt house and she was staying there. They went knocking that house said that they didn't know who Ariki was and they were like yes because the day Ariki came back from Wairau we brought her here you can't tell us that you don't know who she is and they were like oh 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 yeah that girl she left here with all her stuff that was at night and so the next morning they um they did a family group chat because they had told me that they were going to go into Ariki's account on my niece's phone that she had logged in. So they were going to use a known device to try and get into her account to see, you know, where she is. And then when we got into her page, what we found, uh, they were sending me screenshots that uh, my sister was going to meet up with somebody. Um, and then she was saying, oh, I'm going to come cover it up. Or should I bring my shotgun? You know, talking like that. And then she was also saying that, oh, I don't care, just kill me, dog. I'm exhausted as, you know, ASF. I don't want to swear. So I'm exhausted, just kill me. And I'm looking at their screenshots and I'm like, nah, nah, so you just seriously didn't just get yourself into things that I tried so hard to just tell you not to do, bro. So this is why you were tell- not telling me nothing, because you knew I was going to tell you what's good. I would have jumped in my car and dragged you in the car and brung you home. They told me they'll call me back, and I had been waiting all day, got to the night time, and then they rang me. They rang me and they were like, they didn't speak for a little bit. I was like, you just need to tell me. Tell me if they've matched her. And then I could hear it in their voice. They're like, cuz. It might be her. I was like, no. You know, I actually wanted you to come back and tell me it's not her. Because I just had this big feeling it was. But just getting this, you know, starting to get these confirmations. And then I broke. I fell to the ground. I don't think I have ever remembered ever being broken like this ever in my life. And then they came back that afternoon 
and we thought they were coming back. Um, they thought they, she was, they were coming back to get some more information. And then he looked, so it was me and my stepmom, we were standing on the steps. And then he told us, I'm so sorry if we all lost. And they, we just, I was just like, oh. It's like, yep, yeah, she was a match. And then I just shut him off after that and walked away. Walked away from my, my stepmom, she broke. Started crying while I walked away from them. And then um, started walking down the road. And he turned around, he started walking after me. Didn't want him to walk after me, so I started running, took off my shoes and ran down the road. And he was still following me. I was just like, nah. I don't want to be around any of you, nobody. I think I was down the road at the bus stop. I wanted to sit in the sun. I just wanted to be alone. And then I sat there. I honestly, there was no tears that time. I just sat there, staring at the sky. And I was like, sis, damn. You were right, was she? And then, yeah. From there on, it was just all go. You know, them asking, is this the photo you want to release her? Like, yep, I like that photo, that's my sister. Yeah, use that as the media release photo. Cool. And then they're hanging around us, you know, I don't want to go outside, I want to just get stoned. I'm like, oh, I don't want to feel what I feel at that moment, I don't. Because I just, couldn't handle it. Um, yeah, it's still unsolved. So I found out, you know, we had met the person who found her, so the police had um, mistaken her as a sheep. So for um, a lot of people, sorry to interrupt you, so for a lot of people that doesn't make sense. For me, someone that was reading it, it didn't make sense that the police had discovered what well, was happened. So the police have discovered a body and they thought it was an animal. Yeah. And then they've left. Yeah. There was a sticker on the boot that said, police have been notified, you know, so yeah. you don't report it again. And then Sunday, it was still here. So they didn't, um, they were going to get the car towed and crushed if the person who found her didn't find her in time. So can you repeat that part? So they were... So the police found the car and they were actually going to get rid of it. They were going to, they were, it was going to the impound. Yeah, um, only because they thought it was just an animal in there. Um, I have found that out from a family member that they were going to get a towed, if, you know, because they just they had already seen it and it couldn't stay there. But um, there was a walker, somebody walking along there, and he's really in touch with his wider side. So he heard my sister. She was talking to him, she was screaming at him. And then he was like, hey, you know, started having a conversation with my sister. She was shoved under the front driver's seat, like as much as they could get her under there. So most of her body was under there. Well, and, it was burnt, wasn't it? Yeah, but it was burnt. We were so grateful that they found her. Otherwise, she would have just been forever declared a missing person. No. And now, you know, she had, they had done a lot to her. I, find, I found out so much about her that happened, like, because, you know, they do say that she had broken bones and all that kind of stuff and, like, but I, I suppose they forgot to mention that she also had her hands and her feet cut off. And then it was confirmed we had heard this from people talking in a shop of all places. And the shopkeeper heard, came across our family, and then, you know, bring it up to our family, thought we knew. And we're like, hey. No, we didn't know about that. Nobody told us that her hands and her feet were cut off. Um, and 
And then we found out, yeah, that when they found her, yeah, they weren't on her body. They must, the dog found him in the bush. There's a lot of other things, you know, that we heard that happened to her because she didn't deserve to die like that. They did a lot of bad things to her, you know. Also, I heard that she was gang raped and a lot of other things. And that there was so many people involved. And we just, we just hope that they find them all because she was only 18. She was only a little girl. She was loved. She had a family that loved her. She had dreams to live a life to live. She didn't even have any children to leave for me. So we don't have any legacy of her to carry on. She didn't have that chance. And she should have had that chance. And you know, I got uh, for the past like four months, four or five months, I was actually kind of like starting to lose my mind out of anger. Honestly, I was started taking everything out on my family, all my pain, all my hurt. Um, but then my sister, she came to me and she told me, go back to church, sis. Do what you need to do, sis. Get over yourself. Heal. Don't run away from it anymore. I guess I just had to have the courage to go back, to go back to church without her this time. But I felt her there with me, like, I feel her all the time with me, actually. This time, because um, as I mentioned earlier, I was going to all these things, but she was at a different level to me. So this time, I have finally reached what level she, you know, she knew of. Because I, the whole way through everything, from, you know, looking for her, to finding out it's her, to her funeral and everything else. I was praying the whole way through it. And like, not just like religiously praying, I was like pouring my heart out to him. And I'm like, Father, help me, please. You know, like broken ears, like, like I need to do this kind of a thing and then I could feel her there, and I was just hard out talking to her, like, and then also, like, praying as well, and I'm like, sister, you know, you're, you're going to heaven this time, girl, you know, you're, you didn't just kill yourself, it's not like, you know, you're going to hell or anything like that, because you had already given your heart to the Lord in the past, you had already done the salvation prayer, so I know where you're going, girl, you know, and so... Um, I found her Bible. <laughs> this is hers. Like, it comes with me everywhere. Um, and I I had actually gotten this back when I got home from like from Tauranga and then back to Hawke's Bay and then everything was over. It was her birthday. Her birthday is September the 30th. So it was only a couple of weeks after she was murdered that it was her birthday. Um, so this is when I came across all her stuff, all her diaries, all her inner thoughts, um, how she felt when she was alone. Um, God was there. God didn't make her feel alone. 
Um, and she was also writing raps <laughs> about him, and writing songs about him, um, you know, about her life and how rough it was, but how he kept her going through all of it. And so I felt like it was like messages to me, only because when the night her body came home, I had light next to her, and I'm sure my stepmom could hear my prayer, but I prayed for my whole entire family that night, and I knew I needed to, and I told her, and I promised to God, I was like, Father, I will live for my sister, I will live for her. We are not a broken family. This will not break us. We will get through this. We will overcome this because we are mighty and we believe in you and I know you are with us. So I prayed and I prayed for a good like half an hour, like probably longer than that. So when it came to the speech and I was saying to the public, I was put on the spot. I had no notes, nothing. What I said was my prayer, the I will live for you speech. That was my prayer to God. I didn't know what to say, so I just told her, remember, sis, I promised you, I will live for you. That was, you know, everything from me talking to her at home, me having that time to spend praying. And then, you know, after getting all these signs on her birthday and things like that, seeing that she was catching revelation from hearing the word, and then, so catching revelation, that's when you're hearing the message of God and then you're able to catch things from it that you're able to relate to your life. Um, it's like messages that he's speaking through the preacher. And so I knew I needed to go back to church and I hadn't been back in a little bit since I moved up here. I was trying to get my life sorted. And I was like, nah, this is what I need. I'm going to lose it, you know. And it wasn't until my dad told me, you need to forgive them, my darling. I was like, forgive them, Dad? What? He's like, yeah, you're going to church. You need to bring yourself to the point where you've got to forgive them. I'm like, what? But how? And he's like, you just have to. <laughs> and because, you know, because I'm in church, I've learned how to honour my mother and my father, how to get over my hate on my mother that I developed over the years and love them and honour them for who they are to me. I want to, um, all my sister's colours to turn themselves in. I want them to find the guts to be able to own up to what they did and have accountability for it because they know what they did, they know how horrible it is and it's not funny at all. It's not. There's a march. Um, have you heard of Brianna? Brianna, really why? So she's missing. It's a march for justice for all the missing people and the unresolved cases. And this march will be happening in the next couple of months. We're marching for Brianna and Ariki. Um, <laughs> Like, I just had surgery, so she even told me, I'll push your wheelchair, and I was like, and I'll hold the signs. <laughs> so we are going to march to the Parliament steps, um, and we're going to present ourselves to Parliament, and we want to be able to try and, you know, get some things rolling on all of these kind of things because... Missing people and unresolved cases are starting to become like a habit of New Zealand and so they just need to up their game really and they need to do more and have more resources in their area in the right way, you know, because we ain't going to compromise ourselves and then put ourselves in a dark place to be able to get that justice because Araki doesn't want that. I'm excited to be able to help people heal from everything that I've been through, that they're going through, um, teach them tools that I didn't know, that I was taught, you know, and things like that because nobody deserves to stay in there, right? And everybody deserves a second chance. So even 
for the murderers. They did this to my sister. Even if you repent to God and say sorry for what you did, then that will even give us peace and own up to what you did. Because at the end of the day, that is where my sister is right now. She is with God in his heavenly embrace. Only we feel pain. She doesn't. Only we're living on, you know, hell on earth. She's not, you know, but she deserves her justice and deserves to be apologized to because she will hear it whether or not you think she won't. She will. And so will God, you know. And that's basically all I've got to say. Um, but I do um, aspire to hopefully do my own Legacy Diamonds as well for my sister in honour of her because she was doing that. So I've got my youth certificate. I'm studying my diploma in health and wellbeing around mental health and addictions. Um, so everything I do now is for her in honour of her because, you know, the youth just need our aroha. Everybody just needs to give them love all in the right way. And I was able to help Araki bring her out of that shell. And I know that I'll be able to help many others. So that is my passion that I've been going for a lot lately. It's my drive um, that keeps me going, other than my babies, of course. And if anybody wants to mail me information about what's going on, um, anything that they know, then, you know, more than welcome to come and tell me, you know, and our family. Um, I've noticed a lot of people that have given information, not long after that they've gone quiet because they'll either be family of the murderers and things like that. And then obviously getting silenced, then a lot of people will get silenced. People might try and say what they want to say about Araki because I've heard a lot of things, you know, bad things about her and bad people's comments about, um, you know, what she's, what I've done to maybe get what she deserved, but nah, they can just keep their negative opinions to themselves because <laughs> we don't need it and we won't have it and whatever bad you try to throw at us will only just go back to use anyways. Um... Because that's what happens when you're protected by the Lord. You know, there's, there's, there's things that you just don't mess with, powers that you just don't cross with. <laughs> I will honour my sister in every way possible because I know her better than anybody else in this world. I know her because I grew up with her, because I know her mind, I know her beliefs, I know the type of person she is, I know what she likes and what she loves. So it will be me and yeah, and I just want to end this with God bless you all <laughs> and justice for my sister Araki.